Professor of Computer Science, Physics, Genome Science, Bioengineering, and Chemical Engineering. Dr. Baker is uh, quite prolific and has developed the Rosetta Computing Methodology for predicting and designing macromolecular macro structures, interactions, and functions. Through this, he and his collaborators have developed methodology for designing binding proteins to any desired target and designing high affinity binders to the H1N1 virus as well as other targets. The Baker Lab has developed Foldit, many of whom I'm sure you have seen, an interactive multiplayer online game that engages non-scientists in solving prediction protein folding problems. When looking through Dr. Baker's publications, I just want to point out that the Baker Lab has a search engine on his uh, publications. His awards are numerous and include the American Academy of Science, the Biochemistry Society Award, and the Sackler Prize in Biophysics. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Baker today for Medical Grand Ram. Yeah, I'm, uh, sorry about being uh, the delay here. I wasn't able to get uh, my presentation to run on my computer, so I have to talk you through the animations that you won't see. Um, let's see. Actually, uh, is there a pointer? Uh, all right. So um, what I'd like to do today is, um, actually, I'm hoping to learn more from you than you're going to learn from me. Uh, we're very interested now in um, designing uh, proteins which could be part of the sort of the next generation of therapeutics. and. Uh, we have a lot of the methods in hand, but we're, we're, it's not always obvious to us what are the most important problems to go after, what are the real, the real issues one deals with in the clinic. So um, I'm hoping to get lots of suggestions at the end. Um, so this is a, a, an outline of the things which um, I want to tell you about today. And I'm not going to take a long time. I'm just going to tell you a little about, bit about each one, but so you can get a flavor of what, uh, uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, so if you want to make uh, new, uh, new protein-based drugs, you need ways of making new proteins. And that's what I'll tell you about first, uh, designing, so the fact, basically designing brand new proteins. Um, something which we're very excited about now, which um, I'll be saying more about in just a moment, are is um, self-assembling cages, basically containers for molecules um, that we're very excited the possibilities for uh, drug delivery and oh there is okay um, uh, so I'd like you to all think about about uh, the possibilities for this as I'm speaking um, as was mentioned uh, um, we've been uh, designing uh, small uh, stable binding proteins to in principle any target and these could be useful potentially um, as therapeutics in themselves or for diagnostics, um, where they uh, they could have some advantages over antibodies, and then for targeting um, uh, uh, new th new drug delivery vehicles, um, I'll talk about uh, design of small molecule binding proteins. And again, this is a place where we'd love I'd love your input into what sorts of small molecules it would be useful to have high affinity binding proteins for. And uh, of course, when you design new proteins you have to worry about uh, uh, immune responses if you're going to use them inside people. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And I think I'll probably skip over uh, the vaccine stuff. OK, so let's see if this actually works here. So here's the, here's the basic um, the, the kind of pipe dream of, of the kind of thing we'd, we'd like to be trying to make. So uh, uh, you have a, um, uh, this is a, a closed container say, between uh, 20 and 100 nanometers in diameter. Uh, on its surface, it has um, specific binding proteins that are designed that are specific for the target cell, which, let's say, might be a tumor. Um, it also has, in this rendition of the picture, it also has protease cleavage sites for very specific protease. Um, and um, so the, uh, it, it goes to the target cell by virtue of these uh, complementary interactions. Uh, we also would separately add exogenously um, uh, uh, protease, that's, um, that's this red thing here, with a receptor on it that would independently target to the, go to the, to the tumor, say. And it's only when both of these things independently target that the protease would cut open these protease sites on the, on the uh, 
pat on the container, um, releasing the cargo. And uh, this type of picture, uh, you could imagine, um, could have an application to uh, a number of different things. For example, if this is a cancer, this could be a tumor, or these things would be tumor markers, um, uh, uh, for 2 or CD19, and uh, what's inside uh, uh, could be sometimes cytotoxic agent, um, uh, or um, in the case of inflammation, these could be markers of inflammation or um, uh, proteins that are um, talking to Joan Government about uh, multiple sclerosis. These just could be myelin basic protein, uh, binding proteins, something that would target you to the tissue with, um, uh, where there's inflammation, and you could have these things could be anti inflammatory cytokines. Um, in the case of, of, of my knee, we could, I could target something directly there, I'm very highly motivated. <laughs> then I wouldn't have to be eating the methotrexate. I could actually target it there. Um, and likewise, for pathogen uh, binding for infectious disease, one uh, could um, uh, be targeting pathogen surface proteins and, again, be delivering some sort of cytotoxic agent. So that's sort of the, 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 the pipe dream that, um, that sort of you, you can think about as, we're, um, as I'm going through the technology we're developing. Okay, so um, how do you design proteins? Well. Uh, the first step is, well, really the first step is to decide what you want to try and design. So what, say if you're designing a binding protein, what you want to, uh, what molecules you want to try and target, uh, say, you know, maybe CD19 if you're trying to get, make anti-tumor things or some new strain of flu, if you're trying to make um, antivirals. Once you've decided on the target, the first step is do a computer calculation of a sequence that uh, will fold up to a structure where it can um, bind the target. Uh, we use this, typically do this, um, uh, you know, be me or someone in my group sitting at a computer coming up with a sequence. Um, more recently, we've expanded this to the whole world, so fold it players are designing uh, new sequences. Um, and uh, sometimes they look crazy, but sometimes they look really interesting and then you can make them. Uh, anyway, so the next part is after you've done the computer calculation, well, you've designed the protein, so you know the amino acid sequence of the designed protein, um, so that you can just you know what that is. And basically, um, I, I've, I've been designing proteins myself now, and I, I know my amino acid sequence. I basically just paste it into an email to a gene synthesis company, and then they do magic, and back in the mail, uh, a couple of weeks later, comes a synthetic gene encoding uh, the, uh, the brand new design protein, which never existed before. It's a brand new amino acid sequence. And then, uh, and then we can um, uh, we take the gene and we put it into either bacteria or into yeast, and um, we can make the protein and uh, and assay to see whether it does what we want it. So the the the, the DNA, the sort of the synthetic, uh, the ability to make DNA cheaply and quickly is really a key to all of this because um, our calculations aren't very accurate. So we, we have to, in general, um, if we want say a flu binding protein, we have to design many, many sequences predicted to bind uh, the flu to get one or two that actually do bind. Uh, but the fact that we can sort of do this science fiction-y sort of thing of go, going from complete computer fiction to make it in the real world really easily is what makes this all possible. OK, so now I have animations which aren't going to work. Um, uh, but I can describe what, uh, what's going on here. So how does protein design work? Well, you have some, in the simplest case, you want to find an amino acid sequence which holds up to a given structure, say this structure here. And so um, basically uh, what we have is uh, uh, for each amino acid, we have a list of the possible conformations it can have. And then it's basically like doing a jigsaw puzzle. We try, we search through a very large number of combinations of amino acid shapes and identities looking for a combination which really fits almost perfectly to fill this space and make complementary energetic interactions. And so that's the problem of how we go from a structure that we know to um, an amino acid sequence. Um, uh, it, the, the, uh, often we don't, know, we don't know exactly what structure uh, it will be optimal for solving a given problem. And in that case, uh, this is another animation you're not going to see. Um, we've developed methods for, um, for, taking, uh, for going from an extended chain and uh, very quickly folding them up into um, low energy protein structures. And for most of what I'm going to talk about, we're sort of using a combination of these two methods to actually design proteins uh, that have new functions. Okay, so 
the first example I'm going to give is, um, is shown here. Uh, in this case, uh, what we tried to do um, was design sequences that would fold up to brand new protein structures that aren't found in nature. And uh, we developed a, a set of principles for doing this, which I'm not really going to go into detail on, but I do want to show you what the results look like. So there are five rows here. Each of these rows, there's a column called design. Um, and uh, that's a picture of what we were trying to make. And what, what we were trying to make, again, for these building blocks for these cages and other sort of future material, we wanted to have things that were maximally stable and idealized. So these are, um, it's a little hard to tell here, but these are, these are sort of platonic ideal versions of proteins. That Most proteins have these long elaborated loops and distortions that are important for their function. We wanted things that would basically be like bricks of future materials. So we tried to make things that were really um, sort of perfect in the sense of having ideal secondary structure elements, helices and strands, minimal loops, and so forth. Um, so these are the design models we were trying to make. Um, the way that we confirmed, the way that we tested, we went through the process, which I sort of sketched, of coming up with sequences predicted to fold into these structures. As the last part of that, um, we took the sequences and uh, we've developed, developed um, a distributed computing project called Rosetta at Home, where, where we've got about half a million volunteers around the world uh, signed up for. And basically what they do is they, they, um, they make their spare computer cycles on their computer available to us. Uh, and so we have, now what we did was take the, the sequence of, that we got for this protein, send it out to all these volunteers all around the world, and this plot here, each red dot, is a separate volunteer's computer, the result. Um, so we give them the sequence of this, and we ask them to predict, the, to fold up the structure. And then they send us back the energy, which is shown here, and the uh, structure of the lowest energy structure their computer found when it was searching for the lowest energy structure. And um, uh, this is distance from this actual structure. So, uh, so you can see we have there were a lot of people is involved in this calculation. There's a lot of red dots on that plot. And the lowest energy ones are down here, and they're very close to the structure we were trying to make. If it was zero, it would be identical. Um, so this is a very powerful test, sort of an in silico test, that the sequence that we've designed to hold up this structure actually um, likely will, because when we do this massive search for the lowest energy structure, which should be the structure it holds to, yeah, it comes back here. You can see all of the sequences of all of these five proteins have this property that they, that um, the lowest energy states found by these hundreds of thousands of computers um, are very close to what we're trying to make. Now, probably because of that, uh, when we actually made these proteins, uh, they were really extremely stable, much more stable than naturally occurring proteins. And when the structures were solved by NMR, they were basically identical to what we were trying to make. Um, and this just sort of illustrates emphasize that on this side, there's sort of there's superpositions of um, the, uh, the parts of the design and uh, the, the actual structure. And basically, everything's in place, all the side chains and so forth. So we can make up brand completely new structures um, from scratch. And uh, so uh, this gives us a lot, of, a lot of power. But then, of course, like we were, like I was saying, we have to decide what to try to make. Um, we've also been as I said, we've been thinking about containers and materials, so we've also been making um, other types of structures. Those ones were sort of like bricks that were, you know, sort of maybe round bricks, globular ones. Um, so I've been having fun making really long, um, uh, skinny rods. You can imagine making wires and other sort of connective elements out of these. And uh, other people in the group have made, we've been having competitions to see if we can design the longest protein. Uh, uh, so um, I think we'll be able to make sort of whole new classes of materials, maybe things for, uh, for tissue regeneration um, and, and so forth out of these. Now I mentioned um, uh, cages, and that's, as I said, something that we're very interested in now. And I wanted to sort of now show how you can go from these building blocks to uh, cages. Um, and um, uh, maybe I'll so you start with a, a, um, a building block, and in this case, uh, we placed it at the corners of a cube, so eight of these building blocks at the corners of the cube, and when we actually, and then we designed the interface using our design method. When we actually look at these things in the electron microscope, you see these things that look like little dice. You kind of want to roll them. Um, 
we're not good enough now to put different numbers on the different faces. But, uh, but actually, we have, we're working on that now. Um, I mean, not exactly numbers, but be able to get the control so you could really put things on different edges and sides. Um, and uh, so this is electron microscopy of the, those. And then uh, this is a crystal structure, actually, of the, um, this, is a, this is a comparison of what we were trying to make, the cages we were trying to make, and uh, what it actually came out as. And they're, they're basically identical. Um, because of the symmetry, it seems to like, uh, we seem to get even higher accuracy with these type of assemblies than we do with the monomers. Um, so um, what we know about these cages is that we can actually stick proteins like uh, green fluorescent protein inside. This wouldn't be a very good container for a small molecule because things could obviously leak out these sides. But uh, uh, I'll show you pictures in a moment of containers that we're trying to make now that, that really have no gaps in the side. Um, this just shows another picture of that one. This is a, an octahedron, so it has a like, different symmetry axis. This is looking down the face of the cube. This is down the uh, diet. Uh, this is like one of the vertices of the cube. And again, comparing the design model to the, um, the uh, actual physical structure. And we've made other types of cages, too. This is uh, another one, again, the design model and physical structure. So that, those, the cages I showed you were this one and this one. Um, and uh, so those are fine, but when we make them in bacteria, they are uh, already pre-assembled. Um, so it's not. Uh, it, it's not um, it's not as easy as one would like to put things inside. So what we're working on now, and these are things we've just ordered the genes for but haven't yet tested, are cages where they're made out of two components. They have a pink component and a blue component. And in that case, uh, they should, nothing will happen until we mix them together. So we're packaging in those, um, those uh, they have a cytotoxic agents I had in that cartoon slide. Uh, you could imagine mixing uh, the mixing together that, that cytotoxic agent, the blue thing and the pink thing together in a tube. Now it self-assembles, self trapping some of the compound, and then you would just uh, 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 purify away these ones based on a very large size. Uh, so this one, for example, this soccer ball looking thing, has no, no hole. So whatever you put in is going to stay there. Um, other things that are obviously going to be important are to uh, regulate. Uh, we can regulate assembly just by controlling when we mix them. Uh, for disassembly, I showed you a scheme where um, we put a, a protease cleavage site in the, the subunit. Of course, you could also imagine something that uh, has a binding site for a small molecule or a protein at the site of the, um, uh, wherever you want to open up. Um, these same methods can be used uh, to make um, open two-dimensional and three-dimensional lattices, basically crystals. And uh, we're also, um, I, we, I, I some examples I've not shown, of, of two-dimensional lattices that form from these types of structures. Okay, so those are the containers. What about getting the containers to the right place? Um, so now I'm going to talk about uh, the design of binding. Um, this is the, uh, the surface of a, of a protein that we, or a, a protein that we might want to uh, target. Uh, these, um, uh, the way we approach that problem of designing a binding protein is uh, we take the surface that we're trying to hit, again, this surface here, and we place um, disembodied amino acid side chains, which are these stick figures. Basically, they, they, they're freely docked against that shape, trying to find places where they fit in really, really well. So, for example, this ring here fits really, really well into, um, into uh, this, um, this cavity here. Um, do you know, is there water back there? Glass of water. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, uh, um, and uh, um, so, okay, so that, that gives you sort of the handhold. I sort of, you can sort of think of this like a climbing wall you're trying to hold on to, and these things are the hands and the feet. Um, and uh, uh, the next step is to place a body so that it holds all of these, it holds as many of these. Um, uh, uh, in place as possible, that body would basically be a protein scaffold, like maybe one of the ones I showed you that we designed at the beginning. Um, and so, so, uh, and then we want, but we want that thing that we place to connect the dot to be, um, uh, be complementary in shape to this. 
All right, so we tested this out with the influenza hemagglutinin, uh, which is the influenza surface protein, which is shown here. It has a sialic acid binding site on top and a, um, a binding site to the core uh, to the, to the, um, to the uh, stem region shown here. So we've been designing small proteins. Thank you very much. We've been designing small proteins to bind to both regions of the virus. And uh, so here's the, um, here's a blow up of that side region on the virus. Uh, there's this uh, cleft here. And uh, so we start by just placing disembodied amino acids into that cleft. These are side chains. The gray thing is the surface of the, of the, inner, the inner surface there. And then we build or identify protein scaffolds, which are these ribbony things, which hold these place side chains in the optimal orientation to make the interaction. So this is the blue that's the surface now in a uh, colored electrostatic view. And you can see these side chains that were sort of docked in there, now held in the proper orientation by the scaffold. So at this point, we order synthetic genes encoding uh, these designed proteins and um, uh, Two of the examples of those are shown here. Uh, so again, we have the, the, the viral, viral protein surface here, uh, these side chains which we placed in here, a scaffold holding them in place. And you see two small scaffolds here. This one, um, they're both helical. And again, I told you we're really not very good at this. We had to make um, uh, on the order of 80 different designs to find two that work. These are the two. That's why I'm showing them to you. Um, uh, we can, um, I, I don't think I'll go through this in detail, but we can use next generation sequencing methods to probe the contribution of every amino acid in these proteins to binding. So if we had made a perfect design, if this was perfect, then if we changed any single amino acid uh, on this protein to any other, it would bind more weakly. Uh, but we have, uh, we'll, so to test that, to learn how perfect our design is, we change every amino acid to every other one at a time. We basically select for things that bind. And then we identify, we see what the effect of every mutation was by, uh, by using um, high throughput sequencing to, uh, to determine how frequently each point mutation is present before and after selection. And in that way, we can identify shortcomings in the design process, which we can then use to improve the, um, the designs. Uh, and um, uh, we also find from that sets of mutations positions where we can improve on the uh, design. And by combining those, uh, uh, we were able to get down to um, uh, high picomolar binding affinity uh, for, uh, for this influenza uh, uh, protein, uh, human Um So I told you that our success rate was pretty low, uh, but it turns out that when we get it right, we get it right for the right reason. This is now crystal structures uh, comparing the, um, uh, this is a, sorry, crystal structure of of the influenza hemagglutinin, this is this. And then our design protein is shown here in purple. And in red is the structure of this complex. It's superimposed on this, um, so you're not, but you're not, so you're not seeing, but you're not seeing that. And then red is where the crystal, the, where that protein actually is in the crystal. And you can see it's exactly where it was supposed to be. And when you look at the side chains, they're also exactly where they were supposed to be. So this designed protein is really fitting in the, uh, uh, fitting in against the uh, influenza virus in exactly the way that it's supposed to. And that's true for the other one as well. They're really dot, really dot in almost exactly the right orientation. And the side chains um, are making interactions just like they were supposed to, just as in the design model, comparing the uh, green and the orange. Sure. Okay, so uh, this, this particular site on the hemagglutinin is very conserved and these small proteins uh, bind to essentially all group one influenza viruses. Um, and uh, you probably know the influenza virus, this protein undergoes a, um, a conformational change when it gets into cells. And uh, this protein block, these small proteins block that conformational change. And in fact, uh, they neutralize the virus in cell culture. Um, so a um, a pharmaceutical company has licensed these proteins from the UW to try and develop them as anti-flu therapeutics. And this has been very um, educational for us 
as we see the various steps that you have to go through to actually make something into a drug. So they're coming back to us and say, hey, your proteins aren't, aren't stable, they should be in serum. So then we're, uh, we're working on serum stability and all these. And so it's been, been really interesting. Um, we're obviously now trying to design proteins for trying to uh, do two influenza viruses. We're also interested in using these design proteins as part of very cheap diagnostics because we can make these proteins in very large amounts very cheaply. And uh, for, to that end, we've been designing, um, we've designed the other proteins that bind up here to the uh, head region, and we're making more that bind down here as well. And the idea is to have a set of proteins where from the binding readouts, you can figure out exactly what, uh, what uh, influenza virus you have, uh, or hopefully don't have. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we're, we don't we're not we don't have complete recognition, but with the methods for, that we have for um, making these designs, uh, that should be um, should become possible soon. Um, and again, these proteins are all very small; they're much easier to make than antibodies. Uh, so, hopefully, we could, uh, uh, we're, we're working with a group at UW to put these down on paper and uh, try to keep that down. Okay, so that, the, what I just described um, can be used to target uh, extracellular targets. So um, other targets we're looking at now are things like D1 um, uh, and TTLA4, sort of obvious targets that are present that you might want to uh, find for immunomodulatory uh, effects or for uh, say anti-tumor um, uh, therapeutics, uh, other types of uh, Pathogenic proteins like Ebola virus surface proteins, um, uh, and again, this is where uh, we'd love suggestions on you know, where where we see where where what would be really good targets to go for because we sort of have we have the methods now uh, and um, we're just looking for good applications. Okay, but the nice thing about this technique is it can work just as well on intracellular targets, and this is a place where antibodies have a harder time. With intracellular targets, often specificity um, is a very big issue. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples now of designing proteins to be have very specific binding properties. Um, and, uh, so they are um, P53 is degraded by MDM2 and MDM4. They're small molecules that drop off both, 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 both interactions, but there's really no understanding of what the MDM4 P53 interaction does because you can't block it specifically. So we were approached by uh, collaborators who wanted to see if we could make proteins that block MDM4 interactions with P53 but not MDM2. And then um, similarly in the um, apoptotic uh, BCL2 family, there's many family members. Some of them are pro-apoptotic, some of them are anti-apoptotic, and we were approached with the challenge of trying to specifically block a viral um, PCL2 uh, uh, problem protein, um, and I'll talk about that briefly. So the basic idea is that in this design process, we can design in additional affinity and specificity, and I'll show you how we do that. So this is um, the uh, MDM4, MDM2 case. The two proteins, MDM4 and MDM2, are superimposed here. And they're very, very similar, as you can see. Uh, we've come up with this protein shown in blue that really snugs, wraps around the, the, the top of the surface of these proteins, and you can see there's a little bit of a difference. MDM2 sticks out a little bit more here than uh, uh, MDM4 does, and because of that, we can, uh, there's a clash. Our design protein doesn't like the MDM2, and so when you make these proteins, uh, the, um, uh, there's a, uh, uh, this protein binds MDM4 dramatically more tightly than, uh, than MDM2. Uh, this is, um, now with the ECL2 family proteins, um, uh, and maybe just jump down to here, uh, the design protein that we've made binds to this uh, viral um, ECL2 protein, which is anti-apoptotic, uh, uh, and uh, but it doesn't bind anywhere near as tightly to all these endogenous ECL2 types of uh, ECL2 family members. Um, and uh, so the interest in this protein is it's anti-apoptotic and working with Pat Staten's group here, uh, they're introducing this protein into cells via, via polymer delivery techniques. And uh, preliminary results suggest that it, it does induce apoptosis, presumably by, by blocking um, uh, uh, DHRS anti-apoptotic activity. Okay, so the final topic I want to discuss is um, 
sort of another type of potential therapeutic. So uh, this is deoxygenin. Um, it's used to, well, you, you know much better than I do how it's used in the clinic, uh, but sometimes there are overdoses, and so uh, it's of interest to have proteins that, uh, that can bind to it. It's also a really commonly used label on, on DNA, for example. So we thought this would be a good model compound to um, design binding proteins for, and uh, the basic process is very similar to what I described for the protein binding. Um, this is this is the, the, mo the molecule here, the oxygenin, uh, the oxygenin, um, and then here's the design protein we've made in green. You can see it's making these hydrogen bonds uh, with hydrogen bonding receptors, donors, and receptors in uh, uh, here, and um, uh, this is the this is sort of a space filling view of this design protein. You can see it's very straight complementary to the uh, to the small molecule, um, and uh, uh, it it does bind uh, it does bind uh, to the um, uh, very tightly. The, after some optimization, like we did for the flu viral proteins, binds with about 50 picomolar affinity, so it's very very tight, and we were able to get a crystal structure of uh, this this uh, this complex, and um, it's shown here. Uh, so in pink is the model, and in fan is the crystal structure. And you can see in this case too, uh, it's really working for the right reasons. So these hydrogen bond interactions are in place. There's been some slight rotation of the ligand, but but everything's basically in place. Um, so uh, shows this shows we can design. Um, uh, uh, or small molecule binding interactions, just like we can design protein interactions. And um, there are other steroids like beta estradiol, which are very uh, uh, similar to digoxygenin. And um, we can, uh, by what the basic way in which these compounds differ is they don't have um, uh, this, this hydroxyl here is different than this one. Um, I won't take you through the details, but we can, by changing what these groups are, we can program in different specificities for these different small molecules. Uh, and uh, again, we're very interested in, you know, I'd love to hear from you, what sort of small molecules would it be useful to be able to soak up or detect easily? Uh, so we've been thinking about, uh, I obviously have enough infected in my brain, but. Um, uh, so anyway, so suggestions for small molecules. Um, so what about immunogenicity? Uh, well, the way we're approaching this problem is that when we're doing the design calculation, we can try and make the design proteins look as much like human proteins as possible, and specifically avoid known MHC uh, uh, MHC pepti peptide profiles of peptides that bind to MHC. Uh, so we have um, uh, a number of experimental tests ongoing, but uh, none of them are definitive yet to see if we can actually take proteins and make them immunologically silent. Um, so, yeah, so this is basically the, uh, I, I think since I'm, uh, I'll, I'll stop soon, just to sort of summarize, um, so as we understand the biology better, since we, we now have this possible, now I've, what I've shown you is that we can make brand new proteins to order, we can get them to self-assemble into cages, we can, um, we can design binding proteins that target arbitrary targets, uh, and binding proteins that bind small molecules, uh, and so we should be able to start making smarter therapeutics. Um, again, as I suggested, you, you could imagine positioning multiple binding domains in the proper relative orientation, maybe to shut off signaling by some on oncogenic cell surface receptor, and kinase receptor. You can get things, make things that will self-assemble on the pathogen or cell, um, and, uh, or regulate uh, a binding payload delivery by uh, small molecules or proteins on the site. And here's my crazy slide again. But now you see that these would be like the flu binding proteins or the digoxygenin binding protein. I showed you the cage already. Um, uh, and um, uh, putting in a physical protease site is hard. And the idea is that you should miss off target sites because you have to have, co there's coincidence detection. The target needs to have a couple of these, and you also need this to bring in the thing that releases the cargo. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about what potential things are this. Okay, now I can stop there, or I can say a little bit about hold it. Um, any references? Okay, all right.
So unfortunately, the coolest thing is um, this video. Because everyone always asks me, who are the Foldit players? Well, OK, so first of all, what is Foldit? Well, we had um, we developed this, this Rosetta at Home project I described where all, a lot of our calculations are done today. And uh, when you run Rosetta at Home on your computer, um, as hopefully you'll see if you load it on your computer, a screensaver shows up, which shows you the protein folding up or being designed, whatever we're running on, on that particular day. And then people started running in to, um, started running, uh, writing in saying, well, you know, I can see the computer is doing the wrong thing when I watch my computer screen. Now, how they knew it was doing the wrong thing, I don't know. Um, but the helix was moving to the left when they thought it should move to the right. So they wanted some way of going in and playing God and telling the computer what to do. And so Foldit is essentially that, basically a, a, a human game-like interface to, uh, to Rosetta, where you can, uh, you can either have the computer do all the work, like on Rosetta at home, or you can guide, uh, you can move elements around and tell it which way to go, essentially. Um, and uh, um, what's really neat is over the last year and a half, Foldit players have done some really pretty exciting things, like they've, um, they've solved a structure that was that was pretty much uh, unsolved for, for many, many years. Uh, they've actually developed uh, better algorithms for, um, for, uh, for, uh, fold, for folding proteins than, uh, than, than we had. It's kind of, kind of neat. Um, they, you know, folded players have access to um, simple scripting language. And they, since they're competing with all their friends and enemies, and there's, a lot more, there's a lot of motivation for doing better. Um, I think that's how we evolved all, all so small groups. Getting, trying to beat the other guys. Um, so there's a lot of human energy going into this. Um, but what I wanted to tell you about right now is um, uh, 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 about uh, design. They've been designing better enzymes. I didn't talk about it, but we've been designing enzymes over the years. We can't design very good ones and folded players to make them better. Now, the coolest thing, I can't show you this video because, but um, if you go, if you search for nature folded video, you basically get a set of interviews with folded players. And you get a bit of me, but you can cut that part out. That's the good thing about this version. It doesn't have me in it. But anyway, it's really fascinating to see who these people are. Um, all right, so we had designed um, a couple of years ago an enzyme that, that uh, carries out this uh, reaction here um, called the diels alder reaction, which is of interest because uh, it's not catalyzed by naturally occurring proteins. There are two substrates and two carbon-carbon bonds formed between them. Um, it, was, uh, it was neat because um, uh, when we take this designed protein and add the two substrates, product forms, um, and that was very exciting. But what wasn't so exciting was what was the sort of units on the x-axis, which, um, which for a, a native enzyme might be seconds, and for this one it's hours. So it's a very poor enzyme, very poor catalyst. So uh, here's what the uh, structure of it looks like. Here are the two substrates. Uh, there's the, um, the enzyme, and uh, uh, we asked them to um, try and improve it, basically build in something here to cover the two uh, ligands to get more, to be able to bind them more tightly. And uh, they came up with this sort of crazy um, uh, helical extension, which forms this, this, this missing side to the active site where these two substrates are. Um, so then we actually made the enzyme, and it was it's actually about 20-fold faster than the thing we had designed, uh, which was pretty neat. And then when the crystal structure was solved, uh, it was basically uh, what they had designed was um, was basically right. That's where the that part of the protein they had designed really had gone. So uh, so we got kind of excited by about this. So now we're trying to have folded players design you know group two influenza virus inhibitors and help us with other problems we're stuck on. Uh, okay, so um, uh, you know I've been really fortunate to work with lots and lots of really great people. Um, uh, on the scaffold and material side, uh, Noble and Rie Koga designed those um, building blocks. Neil, Will, and Frank uh, designed uh, the pages that I showed. Um, and Fabio and Kosu designed uh, the repeat proteins, those other long proteins. Christy, Sagar, um, and Sagar designed the Sigashigenin uh, binding protein. A lot of the crystal structures were done by Barry Stoddard at Fred Hutchinson. Um, the influenza binders were designed by Trell, uh, Tim, and Aaron. Um, Eva's made uh, uh, work on that, but also designed uh, proteins that um, uh, uh, bind to antibodies in a very, a very highly pH dependent way, which we think will make it much easier to purify antibodies in the future. Eric did the work on VHRF. Um, James did the work on MDM2. And uh, uh, Chris did 
did the immunization work, and I, I uh, the full that work is a collaboration with Dorn Public Group in computer science. That, the stuff I showed was done by uh, Frost. Anyway, so my real purpose in talking to you, and hopefully there's time, is to get suggestions on uh, what we should be doing. 